So let's now continue on with our proof that a monotonically increasing function over this interval a, b is going to be Riemann integrable over that interval. So we've got these formulae for the upper and lower Riemann sums of this function for these general partitions where we are fragmenting the interval up into n equal pieces. We're trying to use these to show that our function is always going to obey the integrability criterion. So what we now need to do is consider what the upper Riemann sum for the function over a partition Pn minus the lower Riemann sum for the function over that same partition Pn. So between these two, you are fixing an n now here. We need to consider what this difference is going to be. And I've written down what that is here. And it does look hideous, but don't worry, this is going to become so, so simple. And this is why this proof is really, really beautiful because of how horrific this looks initially, but how beautifully simple it becomes because this is going to end up telescoping. So firstly, let me just talk you through what I've done here. So I've just taken this and I've subtracted off this. Now they're both sums from i is equal to 1 to n, so I can combine those two together. So I've got the sum from i is equal to 1 to n, and then this bit is from here. So I've got b minus a over n, and then I've got f evaluated at a plus i times b minus a over n. That again is from there. And now I've got the bit that I've subtracted off, which is this bit from the lower Riemann sum, so I've got minus b minus a over n from here, and then f evaluated at a plus now i minus 1 times b minus a over n, which is from here. So hopefully you agree that if I take the upper Riemann sum minus the lower Riemann sum where we're using the same partition, pn, this is the general formula that I will get. And this, of course, will work for whichever n you choose for your partition p. So I now want to demonstrate to you that this sum is a telescoping sum. And to do this, I've written out some of the terms here. And just in case you haven't seen this concept before, the reason it is called te a telescoping sum is it's kind of like one of those telescopes that pulls out and then you can sort of push the different parts of the telescope in on one another and then it becomes something much smaller. So this sum written out in its full detail like this is like the telescope pulled out, and what we're going to see is it will collapse down. We can push it all in, and it collapses down to something tiny. That's the motivation for the name of it as a telescoping sum. So let me show you what is going to happen here. So all I've done is I've written this out in full detail. So I'm, instead of using this sigma notation here, I'm going to actually write out each one of the terms. So we'll start with i is equal to 1. So putting in at 1 for i in here and here, this is what you get. b minus a over n uh, times f at a plus b minus a over n. That's just a 1 there. And then we've got minus this bit. So again, minus b minus a over n times f. And now if you put 1 in here, you get 0. So that bit goes, so you just get f at a. Then let's do i is equal to 2. That's what I've got written here. So we'll get plus b minus a over n f at a plus 2 now, times b minus a over n, and that's that bit. And then this bit here, if we put in 2 here, we'll get 2 minus 1, which will be 1, so we'll get minus b minus a over n times f at a plus b minus a over n. Now, the you we can already start to see why this is going to be simple, because of course we're adding this one to this one, and you'll notice that here, this and this are the same thing, except that this one's got a minus sign in, so that one is actually going to cancel with that. Now, if we continue on, we'll see that this continues to happen, because when you go forward to the next term, this thing that you've got in the minus position here is the minus of the thing that was in the first term on the previous term, and that's why it's going to continue cancelling all the way through. So the entire middle bit of this sum is just going to cancel itself out, destroy itself. So, continuing on, uh, here is the third term, so we've got b minus a over n times f at a plus 3 times b minus a over n minus b minus a over n times f at a plus 2 b minus a over n. And of course you can see again this bit is cancelling with this bit, so the second bit of this third term is cancelling with the first bit of the second term. And this process will continue on when you go on to the fourth term, the second bit of the fourth term will cancel with the first bit of the third term, and it will continue on and we'll have the penultimate term here, which I haven't written down, and then the final term, the nth term, uh, which is b minus a over n times f at a plus n over n b minus a. Now, of course, the n's cancel, and then the minus a cancels with the a here, so this is just f of b minus b minus a over n at f 
of a plus n minus 1 times b minus a over n. And of course this one will be cancelling with the first term of the penultimate term, the n minus 1th term. So basically what's going to happen is this will cancel with this, this will cancel with this, this pattern will continue and all of these terms here, these will all cancel and the only one that will be left is this and this. So I've added some colour on here to illustrate this further. So red is cancelling with red, blue is cancelling with blue, green is cancelling with what would be in that position, the second position, the fourth term, etc. All of this cancellation continues on. And then finally, this first term of the penultimate, the n minus 1th term, is cancelling with the uh, second term of the last term. And then the only things that survive this destruction is this one here and this one here. So these are the final bits of the telescope once it's contracted down that are left. And this is really simple because we've just got b minus a over n times f of b minus b minus a over n times f of a. So this huge hideous sum, it cancels to this because of this telescoping property. It is b minus a over n times f of b minus f of a. So you give me any partition pn, where n is some natural number, this is the correct formula for the upper Riemann sum minus the lower Riemann sum using that partition. It's b minus a, the length of the overall interval, f of b minus f of a, uh, the difference between what the function is at the upper endpoint of the interval minus the function at the lower endpoint of the interval, and then divide it by n, this number of um, sub-intervals that you have divided the overall interval into. And now what we want to do is use this to argue that our function is always going to obey the integrability criterion, but this is reasonably obvious. Remember, the integrability criterion is that there must exist a partition or a dissection such that the difference between the upper and lower Riemann sum using that partition is arbitrarily small, i.e. whatever epsilon you give that is greater than zero, you must be able to find a partition such that this difference is smaller than that epsilon. But you can see now that actually you know, there's a huge number of partitions out there, but I don't even need to worry about all the different ones I could consider. I can just consider these simple ones where I've divided this interval uniformly into n pieces. And even with this, I'm able to prove that the integrability criterion is satisfied because this difference between the upper and lower sums is this. And you can see that by making n bigger and bigger, I can make this indefinitely small. This and this, after all, are a constant for our function and our interval that is set. Uh, and by making this bigger and bigger, I can make this indefinitely small. Just to go into that in a little bit more detail, so consider any epsilon greater than zero. I want to find a partition such that the upper and upper sum minus the lower sum for that partition is less than epsilon. So I know that for these uniform partitions, this is what that difference is equal to. So if I just make sure that this is less than epsilon, which I can always do simply by making n large enough that this becomes less than epsilon. And I can even find the inequality for n just by manipulating this. So bring the epsilon down here, bring the n up there, and then I get that I need n to be greater than b minus a over epsilon times f of b minus f of a. So all of these numbers, this number and this number, they are fixed. So then if you give me this epsilon, I can just put this into this formula, this comes out as probably some horrible real number. You then just need to find a natural number that is bigger than that real number, and the Archimedean property tells us that that's always possible. So find a natural number bigger than this, and then use that, and then you're guaranteed that this thing, with that natural number in, is going to be less than epsilon, and therefore that the upper minus the lower sum for that partition that splits you into that n number of pieces is going to be less than epsilon and hence the integrability criterion is satisfied. So this monotonically increasing function is always going to obey the integrability criterion and therefore is always going to be Riemann integrable over that interval AB.